Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of the Kevin Show. I don't know what I'm going to call this one, but we'll see. Um, I actually am doing take two of this. I was just expecting uh, Mr. Outback Custom Models um, to join us, but I don't think that's going to happen. So welcome back. Um, I got a new headset, so hopefully there's a difference there. Uh, there's a new kick up Joe coming out. Well, I just unprivated the video, so it is live now. Go check it out. Um, so we're going to have a couple topics today. But before that, disclaimer, um, the views expressed in this show were not the views of the Model News uh, group, nor of the people associated with Model News. They are my own personal views. So, a little disclaimer there. Also, um, there will be some sensitive topics, and there will also be some language that... Um, if you're not comfortable with, please do not watch. But please, you know, if you're fine with all that stuff, you know, please just stay tuned. You'll have some fun. So what this show is really designed to do is really have a connection with the people, I guess, and have a talk show sort of feel to it. And K Cup of Joe, I know I said it in the uh, opening of that one that there is that uh, talk show feel, but this one's more of like a one-on-one, you know. Where did I get this idea? Well, it's this idea has been in the making for quite some time. What I mean by that is when I was a kid, and this is gonna I don't want to go too in depth with stories here, but when I was a kid I used to listen to talk radio at night before I went to bed. And I remember this radio station, Coast to Coast AM or something like that, and they just have that one guy, there's no phone callers or anything, it's just the one guy talking and it always uh was sort of fascinating how someone can keep can carry on a conversation by themselves for an extended period of time. So, um, luckily I have a lot of uh, experience within broadcasting and stuff since I am one of the heads of the broadcasting department at my school. Even though they do, they do uh, live feed video, I don't, obviously. Um, but still, we'll see. So, I guess the first topic we'll talk about here is the uh, brand new... Caterpillar 325F, and they released the vi promotional videos up on their YouTube channel uh, Thursday or Friday, one of the two days. And it's yes, they brought back the 325 series finally, and it's taken them long enough too. But you know, it they discontinued the 325 series after the uh, D series. There was no 325E, but now we got an F. But the 325F is a replacement for the 321 DLCR. So um, I guess they were beating a dead horse with the 321 for so long. Um, the only major upgrade the 321 got in the past number of years was the E-Series cab, in which the 321 still looked really cool. So, actually, I'm going to check cat.com right now. If I ever do go quiet when I'm looking something up, I do apologize. I can't multitask like that. Um, but anyways, whoops, I went to Africa and the Middle East, which is not right. So, um, of course, we've seen earlier this year the introduction of the 335 FLCR um, to replace the 328, sorry Sal, I think you need to um, update your uh, name there uh, from 328 to 335. Nah, I'm kidding. Um, but, I guess it, I guess that size would be classified as medium, I'm guessing. But, uh, the 321 DLCR is still classified as a current model, even though it probably won't. The 325 is even classified on uh, cat.com yet in their equipment section. And if you've never been on cat.com and looked through their equipment specs and all that... It, you'll get a decent amount of time out of it, just in all honesty. Um, again, if you here's just a little bit of a thing here. If you hear me coughing, I do apologize. I am sick, as I mentioned in episode one last night. Um, but really, the only reason that they're upgrading their Zero Tail fleet is because, one, we've seen the same two Zero Tails for a number of years now. The 321 and the 328. DLCRs. They've been out for so long now, and the only upgrade they've ever gotten was an E-Series cab, really. Um, so, really, it was beating a dead horse at this point. It's been about, God, at least 
eight years, I'd say, for the 321. Even the 328, though, because um, I'm, I'm putting some mathematical equation behind this. But um, really, after a while, if you keep a you know a certain type of equipment going, you're just beating a dead horse. Um, so it was time to upgrade. It really was. So yeah, um, the 325, and it's not even an FLCR. It's just the 325F. Um, I don't know the why they dropped the. Uh, CR because they still have the FL like everything else but um, if you don't know um, the F series has tier 4 final engines or yeah diesel engines um, the E series only had tier 4 interim which is why the E series was so short lived I think they're going to keep the F series going on for about as long as the D series was and that was from pro roughly about two th late 2005 because they still had the, the um, power stripe logo for some time they're getting, the D series lasted from about 2005 to about roughly 2011, 2012, at least 2012 when the E series was produced or started being produced. Um, so over that about oh god about five or uh, six to seven year span. So will we see the S series last that long? I don't know, but how it turns out because it seems like all the cat stuff is going to the E's. Um, like, the, their pavers are even in the AP655Fs, which, one, cat pavers are starting to really look ugly, to me, if, at least. The D-Series look fine. The F-Series pavers look weird. We have the F-Series backos. Um, I don't... We are actually on the F2-Series backo, and they really... And I think I said this last night. They've lost the bubble cap. It's more of a box cab. If you look at it, it, it's not the bubble cab we've grown accustomed to when they came out with the E-Series back of loader. So, uh, actually, I'm going to pull up an image of it real fast. Um, it, it'd be a 420 F2. Um, 420 F2, I've seen the, the promotional photos for it. And if anyone has that first gear case, 580... ST or whatever the fuck it is. It's the Universal Hobbies. It sort of resembles that cab wise. It looks like the cab is more box boxular than it is uh, bubble bubble style. Um, it looks pretty cool. I'm gonna be honest, but I want to see one in person before I give my final statements. But it does look pretty good. I will admit, it's more of a straightforward cab. Um, the only thing is, though, the IT version, I wish the arms would have been just, like, straight black. Again, the only reason I don't like the powerage stuff is just because the imbalance of colors. Like, with the C-Series, there was a great balance of colors there. Even with the D-Series, there was great balance of colors. But when we get to E-Series, it's more yellow than anything. So, uh, the 430F2, this stuff look The open cab version of the F2-Series backos doesn't look right to me. But... Um, really, it's sad to see what some of the equipment's going into. Of course, it, I'm saying that from a perspective of I was born in the 90s, the really late 90s, like six months. If I would have been born six months later, I would have been born in the new millennium. But I'm accustomed to seeing, like, when I was younger, I was exposed to younger, or, um, younger equipment. I was exposed to older style equipment, you know, like the, um, B series and C series, and some people don't don't even remember the B series. Some of the people in the community were born in the C series, which it, there's no problem with it. There isn't. What I'm just saying is though that um really we've gone to such a point where equipment's so technologically advanced that one five dollar part will bring down the entire machine. And my good buddy Anthony Lucibello, he does have a point when he says that the older equipment are workhorses, they will last forever because one little five dollar wire will not break the machine. There's no computerized systems to break the older equipment as much, at least I you know, there's always the consoles, but I think we can live without those for a little bit. Um but everything's just so computerized. It's ridiculous. 
But at the same time, though, I can see why they do it. They want more produ productivity, and they want to get the jobs done faster. Now, as a photographer, in my standpoint, you don't want... Don't get me wrong. You, I want to see jobs get done. I want to see workers get paid. But you, do, as a photographer, you do not want the jobs to get done fast. And that does sound selfish, I know. But let's put it this way. The longer a project's there the more opportunities get to get the golden image you got. And I really, every photographer has that one defining image, and that stands true for heavy equipment photographers. We have that one defining image that will separate us from everything else. And I believe that a lot of people still have yet to find that one defining image. I do. Um... One thing I've noticed is, though, the younger people in the community, and again, I'm not ranting on anybody, I'm just, you know, it's just something I've noticed, it's an observation, that, um, they can't take stuff, they can't take, like, difficulty as easily as some of us other, some of us older generation can, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not ranting, I'm just pointing out my observation, but, um, sorry, I got a text, actually, um, now, again, I said this in the first episode, um, check out BEC Excavation, um, his, um, diorama stuff is just so badass, it looks so real. Um, I'm looking at it as one of the CT660 hauling bricks on a road, and the backdrop is just so fucking cool. And, you know, kudos to him, great job. Uh, but, uh... Let's see here. Um, now, MEH, Diecast, um, he got a second Caterpillar 272C, and I I only have one thing to say, you know. You know you got money if you can buy two of those things. I mean, those are brass skid steers. Them things cost 300 bucks. Are they way overpriced? Certainly, but they're, they're fucking CCM brass. Brass models cost a shit ton of money, because... Brass is one of those precious metals. You know, you try to go out and buy a trumpet. They're what? 500, 600, 700 bucks brand new? You know, they're like 300 used. And, you know, someone someone else's mouth was stuck on that, you know? So, it's understandable why CCM's brass models are so expensive. And we explained this in the K-Cup of Joe, too. Um, but at the same time, though... Sorry, adjusting my headset... At the same time, though, um, I can see why not many people have it. So, MEH, you know, glad to see you got a second one. And just being flat honest, great. I'm glad to see you got a second one. He also got a Case uh, 1845C model. Um, I would love to have that model. I'm just being honest. But at the same time, you know, um, I don't know. So... Sorry, um, sorry, like I said, if I, if I go silent, I'm probably typing, uh, I, I, I'm not multitasking, I'm not the multitasking type of person like that, um, now one thing I've noticed is it's getting harder and harder to find a Caterpillar 627K, the Tonkin one, so, if you've been living under a rock, uh, the last number of months, um, I'm going to put it like this, uh, Tonkin and, Tonkin and Norris got both lost their licenses, I covered this last time, apparently there's supposed to be one more shipment to every D dealer, like 3000 toys or diecast models that co, of those certain models, and I'm waiting on the shipment of the 627Ks, I'm going to get at least three of them, mark my words, because every scraper set, site I've ever seen, has had at least three of the same exact scrapers. Well, um, why is that? And they're not the push-pull scrapers. The only reason I'm getting the 627, I'll, actually, I'll explain that in a minute. The reason there's three is you have a constant stream of, you know, scrapers working. You have them just going in circles normally. And you can just have one ejecting, one traveling, and then one actually scraping. So, 
it's understandable why there's three. Now, the reason I'd get the 627 over the 621 is, if you think about it, it's a smarter thing, because you actually have more parts in the 627. You have the push-pull function, and you have the extra engine in the back. Why does that make a difference? The 621 and 627, they, they um, cost the same exact amount of money, $124.99, I think. So, 124 to $125. Um, so, you know, why would you not, why would you spend less money, or wait, hold on, why would you spend the same amount of money and get less model? That's the thinking behind that. I see a lot of 621s around here. I've seen at least 15 this year. But why would I spend money on something that has a lot less parts and does not have a one... And why would I spend money on something that has one less function than a model that costs the exact same and is a twin engine? Which I know it doesn't... It may, I may make it sound confusing. I'm sorry. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. Um... Which I usually record these late at night anyways because there's no distractions whatsoever. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but first, here's a quick advertisement. Um, the Anthony Lucibello show will be coming back. Um, he, Anthony, he uh, interviews various people throughout the model community. Um, so be sure to check it out here on the Model News channel or on the Model News family of channels. Um... It'll be somewhere. We'll we'll pop it up somewhere, and we'll give you the link. Also, be sure to check out the uh, Model News Instagram page for all the latest. Uh, it's run by a good friend of mine, Patrick Crocker, aka Diecast Construction Page. You know, great guy, and you know he does a great job. Um. So, okay, moving on. God, I forgot what I was going to say. I really did. Um, but, okay, so I, I know what I was going to say now. The new uh, the new company, Diecast Masters, they said that they'll have some new and exciting releases. And if they come out with something completely new that, you know, everybody will flip over. Because it, it's never been really done before in a cat library. Or cat paintwork or cat style, whatever you want to say it as. Then, you know, I'll be impressed. If they come out with a 321, a 328, a 335, or a 325 FLCR, or DLCR, or whatever, I will be impressed. If they do, I honestly think that these guys will not match the bar that Tonkin have set. Well, they'll probably match the bar that uh, Norris got set, but that's not really hard to do. I think even Ertl matched it at some point or another. Um... Actually, interesting story about that. The D5K2 and the 850K, I ordered those at the same time. The D5K2 costs almost twice as much as the 850, and the 850 is twice the size. The D5K2 was broken in the box. Fuck you, Nor Scott. Fuck you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Diecast Masters, uh, if there's any representatives watching... Um, Again, like I said, this, th these are my views, not Model News is review or views on this stuff. Um, I'm just think I'm just saying you got to prove yourself to me and a lot of the collectors. You know, if Cranes etc. does gives you a highly recommended review, then I will buy one of your models. Th then and only then why buy one of your models is if Cranes etc. gives you a uh, highly recommended or even outstanding review. Tonkin Replicas did that with the first model they put out and the first model they reviewed, which was the 972K. And really, they did a great job with that model. They did great. Some people, There's some doubters because, yes, they do have some quality control problems. But you know what? Sorry. Um... But you know what? That's how it is. Um, they did do a good job. They proved themselves right off the bat. And I ordered all the Tonkin models I, that were out at the time. So, we'll see. I still have yet to get the Material Handler and the 340, which I'm doubting on both. The Material Handler would be cool because there's only been two cat Material Handlers ever made. 
well, actually three if you count the CCM. Uh, three eighty, or three no two forty five. Um, sorry, a little distracted. Um, there was the three forty five BMH, and a lot of those were turned into three forty five Bs, which is un undoubtedly one of Cat's most popular machines ever in any configuration. And then there's this weird looking Cenobogan, you know, some weird European ass style machine. Of course, if you look at it, Tonkin really did focus on European and Asian style cat machines. The D6R, the R series in America was Power Stripe, which means it was before 2005. Then we went on to the T series, which we're still going on. We're still dragging on with that. It's like cat has cinder blocks um cast it to their ankles with the t series they just don't shake them and eventually they're going to have to of course there's the d10 t2 which ccm is making a model of of course and nobody's gonna buy it because it's gonna buy cost a shit ton of money and it's a 124 scale um but there is gonna be a coal blade and a ripper some there's two versions of it one of them's gonna have like a coal blade on it or something like that but I'm just saying, I'm not I'm not being negative about it. I'm just saying that nobody's going to buy the D10 T2 model. But back to the topic at hand. Um, the the uh, the 340, that's an Asian style machine. And I'm going to put it in the way that Kevin Drennan, uh, CatMac 316, put it. The 336 and the 345 had a strange baby and it turned out to be the 340. And that's exactly what it is. It's a mix of both. Um... Of course, the black cab on it is pretty cool. The black D-series cab, which some people could buy and put it... I guess it's compatible to put on a on a 336D or something strange like that. And if you want a black cab and are lazy enough not to paint your own, the cab that comes with it black. Um, but back to, you know, the, three, the material handler that Tonkin made, I hear it's great, but would I pay... What is it, like 110 for it? I don't think so, because I just don't like the look of it. And not I'm not saying the look is everything, it's just, it's not appealing to me. The sword, the sword, um, asphalt distributor, that never really appealed to me until I seen a real-life one in action. And if I see a real-life material handler like that in action, I will be glad to buy it. But it's just not appealing to me. You know... The look of it, I mean, it just looks weird. You know, the 345 BMH, I've never seen a 345 uh, material handler, but that still looked good to me. It did. Because it looked like, you know, um, like, it still had the excavator style body to it. Was it an excavator? Of course it wasn't. But, and... This is going to lead off topic by seeing this uh, post on Instagram of a kid that uh, put a Hitachi 870 bucket on a 345 BMH and called it a long reach. That's not a long reach. A long reach is actually like, it actually has a long stick and boom on it. Not, and I'm not, I don't know how to put this, but a material handler does not have bucket linkage and there's no way, no fucking way in hell that it will suit linkage like that if you can if you can show me a material handler that's been converted into a long reach i will take that back but you know just saying a long reach material handler just isn't feasible it's not um so anyways back to the topic at hand um the 340 i covered that um the scrapers were a great idea uh, we already know that Norse Scrap's not going to actually do anything new scraper-wise. Because the 623G was the best-selling scraper that they had. And they had how many versions? They had the Power Stripe. They had the Power Edge. They had the Camo. They had the Weathered. They had probably four or five versions of it. At least four. And there's probably one out there that I don't know of and probably missed. But there's at least four versions of it out there. So, of course, it sold well because... You keep spraying versions at people, they're going to buy it eventually because it suits, you know, every model suits somebody differently. Like, again, Cat Mac 316, he loves his material handler and he loves the look of it, but I just don't. 
Um, but it's great to see a K series. Now, obviously, I was like most people disgusted with the look of the K series scrapers, even the H series really is when they adopted that design, but I was kind of disgusted by it. But it turned out not to be that bad. It really wasn't that awful. Um, I've actually adapted to the design, and, you know, all the new stuff we adapt to. You know, there's an old saying in life, either adapt or perish. Well, I mean, like, if a guy gets thrown off his, you know, uh, 1977 Cat 245 and then thrown onto a 336F, you know, he's going to have to learn how to use it, all the mechanical, si or not, all the electrical systems on all the new computerized crap, or else, you know, he's not going to be able to run it right. Um, of course, that's in the days where they had the one stick out in front for track control. Um, but really, the the look of it has grown on me, and I want to get the scraper because, one, the only scraper that has ever been made, the only scraper mall that has ever been made, and I'm probably wrong, so correct me if I am, that has ever been made with the push-pull function has been a 657, and that's way too fucking big. Push-pull functions can be used on quite a few scrapers. And it's great to see one, you know, that's not phototypical. You know, there's a lot of 621s around, like I said, but there's no 621 models until now. The 627s, there's not been any 627 model for quite some time, if at all, until now. So Tonkin really put the customer's opinion in mind. And I, if Diecast Masters can do that, welcome to the fucking club. If they can take some people's opinions and turn it into something feasible and turn it into something that the collectors wanted to buy. Now, not only that, but if they can take the collector's ideas and come out with a series of stuff that suits everybody, then you know that they are their keepers, model builder-wise, model maker-wise. Diecast Masters, their name is Diecast Masters. That's saying a big game. You know, they're saying, hey, we we mastered this. We, we're ready to, you know, take everybody on. But they haven't proven anything to any of us. They're a new company, and they have the biggest, arguably the biggest, uh, well, not really arguably, but the biggest construction company in the world. Big, biggest construction equipment company in the world that's a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, they got they got Caterpillar as a client. That's a lot of pressure. Caterpillar has a large share of the world's equipment, um, manufacturing, you know, whatever. And every year, it's Caterpillar, Komatsu, John Deere, cases up there, Link Belt, you know, all those manufacturers are up there. But Caterpillar has been on, up top, Komatsu second for so long. So long. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Tonkin did a great job. Their public relations was excellent. It really was excellent. You know, there is even uh, this lady on Facebook named Elizabeth Amber Schmidt or something like that. She was a Tonkin rep. She was a Tonkin representative, and she went around adding scale model collector people on Facebook, and she private messaged quite a few of them saying, Hi, I'm from Tonkin Replicas. I would like to know your opinion on what we need to improve, on what models we should make next. What are some strengths, weaknesses? What, you know, that that's great public relations. Norscott never did that, of course, because, well, it's Norscott. But if Diecast Masters can have that public relations, they're going to be fine. But they got to prove themselves, not only to me, but quite a few people out there. And some people have hope. Some people don't. It's up in the air at this point because they have not produced a model on their own. They're going to remarket Tonkin and Norscott models um, as their own. Like what Norscott did with Ertl and NZG. Now, I found this funny. I was listening to a cake up. NZG, Conrad, Ertl, all them guys lost all their Caterpillar license, licenses seemingly um, seemingly uh, spontaneously. And also, well, simultaneously. Norris got in Tonkin. 
the two manufacturers for Caterpillar, of course, CCM was a manufacturer for Caterpillar 2 in the 90s for, you know, you guys that want to be historical about it. But, again, CCM really isn't counted in this. The two main manufacturers for Caterpillar models lose their licenses. And back in the day, CCM and, uh, or, God, not CCM, NZG and Ertl were the main manufacturers of cat models. They lost their licenses spontaneously and simultaneously. And Norscott was a new upstart company, and they really haven't produced any models at that point. Then they came in, they blew everybody a fucking way, and then they lost it. When all the big companies came in, like TWA, or when all the highly detailed companies that put a shit ton of effort in their models, like um, when CCM stepped up their game, or TWH and Sword, when those guys came in, Norscott really lost it because they could not adapt to what was really coming up to be the standard in models, you know, opening doors, um, functionality, which was obviously always a big thing, um, but when people more put more emphasis, you know, more detail, more functionality, and more everything, make it more like the real machine, they could not keep up with that, which is, which is unbelievable, because Norscott was really the uh, king of the mountain there for a long time. And they was a new upstart company when they got their cat license. They didn't produce many models beforehand, if I'm not mistaken. Diecast Masters is following the same suit. You know, it's 2015. Norscott, they're done for. You know, expect them to go bankrupt because the Diecast Masters parent company funded them for so long. It's been well documented. Um, but, sorry. Um... Really, they haven't made any models, and they get Caterpillar's license. So, a lot of pressure. We'll see if they can perform in their first batch of their actual models. I expect them to be pretty well, but they still have yet something to prove to me. Um, also, um, God. Uh, I think that's about it for now. Um, of course, Caterpillar... Nowadays, they seem to like to carry on series of stuff. We already covered how the T-series is just like dinosaur bones at this point. But the M-series graders now... I wish we could actually get an M-series grader that is not cost that does not cost close to $300. Because I would never spend $300 on a grader model. But yet, yeah, also doesn't fall apart. Uh, the Norscott uh, M-series graders, they are terrible. But, you know... Nothing you can really do about it. Um, I'm really looking forward to what comes ahead through the rest of this year and early next year. I'm expecting a Diecast Masters announcement soon because they said that they have some new exciting releases coming out before the year is up. Uh, we're approaching October really fast, so we'll see how that goes. Which, I'm going to see if they actually have a Facebook page. I doubt that they do. No, they do not. There's a die. There's a Masters diecast uh, shop, and that's for racing cars, models, whatever. Um, I'm gonna Google it real fast. But diecast Masters. We'll see what they got. I'm not saying that they, you know, will suck, but, um, now here's some interesting, Caterpillar Inc. has named a Hong Kong-based Diecast Models, or Diecast Masters Company, LTD. I think it's based in, uh, uh, Australia, as a new scale model licensee, replacing both Norscott and Tonkin. They're formed through the purchase of the Caterpillar scale model businesses of both Norscott and Tonkin. Although it's new as its licensee, Diecast Ma Masters has a 26-year history of brand and product development with Caterpillar, manufacturing and distributing Caterpillar diecast for more than 14 years. Uh, 140 or 150th um, scale model replicas will be their focus, uh, and others will play a role. Diminishing uh, turnkey ready or demonstrating turnkey readiness, Diecast Masters will produce the first models in the new line before the end of 2015. 
Initially, initially, former Norscott and Tolkien items will con con constitute sorry, the basis of the Diecast Masters catalog. Model developments will be presented in 2016. Um, Diecast Masters models will be distributed to retail channels in the United States and Mexico exclusively by B2B replicas. That's a great deal of information. This is sourced from uh, modelretailer.com. So uh, thank you for your great post there. Thanks for, you know. But um, this was announced, obviously, August 25th, so a little bit over a month ago. Um, we'll see how this goes. Be really well. Um, now as for model news... Um, we're hoping to have a new program launched where we can actually have one show per day. And I know it's a little bit extensive, but we're it's not going to be starting this week. It's going to be starting the week after next, where we will have one show per day. And we will, um, you know, we're going to stockpile shows next week. So at the, that's the plan, at least. And then we'll have one show per day, pre-recorded, obviously, up on the channel. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, this turns out, but, um, also, Model News shirts, um, right now we're going to order them as per, uh, as per requested, um, so they are $25 free shipping, um, $25 free shipping, uh, contact me, Kevin Rollins, uh, on Facebook, or message me on Instagram, at K Rollins Photography. If you want a model new shirt, um, again, they are $25. We accept uh, pretty much money order, really. Um, just, but yeah, we'll accept cash. So $25 cash, um, and we'll have it out to you in a matter of time. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm actually waiting for my personal shirt now. Um, it should be in within the next week or so. Again, it takes time to produce them, of course. Um, thanks to the representatives at Custom Inc. for their uh, unwavering support. And they made the process really easy. If you want uh, your name on the back of it, it will cost you an extra $5. Um, a name or number, both on the back, it doesn't matter. So, you know, if you want your name or number on the back, $5, so $30 total. And we'll have that out to you as fast as possible. Obviously, you got to have, give it time to have it printed. But remember, contact me on Facebook, Kevin Rollins, or on Instagram, K Rollins Photography. Thank you. Um, so the Sunday Cake Cup of Joe, uh, I was supposed to record one this evening with uh, Diecast Mania. But he's actually working on his custom Cat uh, 350L Excavator. And, you know, all the luck to him. He's done... A lot of work so far into it, and you know he deserves it. So, anyways, uh, I think that's really just about it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do. Um, I know that I've enjoyed it, and thanks a lot, guys. And we will see you on the next one. Uh, so yeah, thanks.